Well, you, you're very good students. You look like students because you all have now these names in front of you. And this, this looks like a business school class. Very experienced students, knowledgeable, which really is a challenge to the professors when the students, first of all, often know as much as many of the students and B have access to wireless to check all the facts and figures. Uh, that's the new, new uh, way of teaching. My name is Bob Atkins, and I'm uh, Director of Policy Research here at the Columbia Institute for Teleinformation. So I, on behalf of CITI, the Columbia Business School, and Columbia University, I'd like to welcome you to Columbia. Uh, this is the Columbia University in the city of New York, as uh, you see on all of its letterhead. Uh, being part of New York is an important part of Columbia, Columbia Business School, and CITI because of uh, the interesting businesses, people, uh, things that go on in New York, and I'm glad you've come up here on, a, on such a beautiful day. Um, this is a, a, a rare time in uh, that July is pleasant and uh, comfortable in New York, so uh, welcome. As I said, I'm with CITI. CITI is 26 years old. We celebrated our 25th anniversary last year, uh, a, a big event uh, marking a milestone. We were uh, probably the oldest uh, university-based research center on telecom policy, telecom business, telecom uh, developments, internet, mass media, uh, as, as well as telecom, uh, the, the entire range of the telecom IT business. Um, it w we were founded uh, 26 years ago by Ellie Noam, who you'll hear from uh, later in the program. Um, I certainly encourage you to stay in touch with CITI. We like to look ahead a bit and not too far. We're not ivory tower uh, researchers, but we are, have a sort of practical bent, but forward looking. One of the major programs we're doing uh, over the last few years has been a, a, a theme called ultra broadband, um, which is our vision and expectation of how the broadband networks will evolve both uh, and the content, types of content that will be moved over those ultra broadband networks. And of course, wireless is a major part of the picture. And uh, uh, we're very uh, eager to uh, learn from you today about developments in the wireless business, in the advertising, mobile advertising business, because that seems to be one of the big uh, growth areas of the telecom industry. Uh, just logistically, uh, we'll be taking a number of breaks during the day. Uh, restrooms are here on the lobby level, men's to the right, ladies to the left. Uh, we'll be having lunch uh, roughly behind this room here in uh, a lounge and outside. Uh, space will be also available. Um, we do have wireless. Uh, there's a, an open Columbia University wireless Wi-Fi system. Uh, if that's not accessible, it fluctuates. Uh, we have a, the business school has a system that's called, you'll see it on your screen, it's called WOFI, but that needs a password and an account. We do have some temporary accounts uh, outside, so you can pick that information up if you need to access the WOFI system. Last thing I'd like to mention is the master class in communications, internet, and media, which Professor Noam, myself, and a colleague, Raul Katz, teach in the fall, this upcoming semester. It's a program where uh, we take some of the best and brightest second year MBA students in teams, link them up with telecom, media, internet companies that have a problem or an issue that they'd like some uh, consulting advice on, some research, uh, business oriented uh, research. And uh, last year we did M&A projects, uh, corporate restructuring projects, uh, technology evaluations, pretty wide range of topics. I mention this because uh, many of the students are very, very interested in the internet, the mobile internet, uh, the, the area that you, the, many of you are involved in. So I'd like to bring to your attention this master class and to the extent your companies have a, an interesting, challenging project that uh, a team of uh, four to six MBA students could tackle over the course of a semester, please contact me. I'd like. Uh, I'd like to hear from you, and if you've got these good projects, I, uh, we, we think we can help you as well in your business endeavors. Um, it is a, a privilege for us to uh, 
be working with CTIA on uh, this, this program today and hosting it. Uh, I've known Mike also for many, many years. Uh, I was in Washington and uh, found Mike uh, as a very effective advocate uh, and representative of uh, CTIA while I was at the FCC and while I was chairman of the North American Numbering uh, Council. And so Mike and I, uh, I think, have enjoyed putting this program together and look forward to it. On that note, I'd like to introduce Steve Largent. Well, if you'd reach underneath your desk, there's a blue book and a pencil. Put away all of your... No. I just wanted to say that because I thought it'd be kind of fun. Um, welcome uh, uh, to this morning's uh, session. Uh, I want to welcome you all. Uh, I was thinking about, as I was sitting in my chair over here and thinking about being at Columbia University, I think the last time, no, it wasn't the last time I was in New York, but one of the last times I was in New York, I, was, I turned on the TV in my hotel, and uh, there was a story that was playing about Columbia University and their football team. And their football team had just broken the longest consecutive losing record uh, in their history or NCAA history or whatever it was. But uh, that really has been my only association with Columbia University until today. And uh, I just want to say uh, what a pleasure it is to uh, be here, Ellie and Bob. Uh, they've uh, really uh, done a great job in organizing this with us. As you all know, it's the first time we've ever associated ourselves with a particular school uh, in conjunction with this particular midsummer uh, reevaluation or look at the industry that we hold every year. Uh, I, I don't have it in my notes, but I know, in fact, that it's true that when Mark was leading this particular session, that part of the reason that was held in the summertime, because it was the best time to golf, and that our places that we picked to, to, uh, to, to have our meetings uh, corresponded with a good golf course. But uh, uh, I, I still uh, uh, think fondly of Mark and have his picture up on the back of you know, my, where my desk is and uh, think about him often, and, and, and we miss him at CTIA, I can say for sure. Um, but um, beyond that, I just want to say uh, what a pleasure it is to host you all here and uh, hope that you have a, a good session today. I think we've got some uh, very interesting uh, news lined up for you. Uh, I just want to give you a couple of statistics that I brought with me. Uh, the world of mobile data continues to expand, as you know, and one important way that uh, we see that is in terms of wireless data revenue. Uh, some of you may have seen this before, but uh, from the end of 2007 to the end of 2008, carriers' wireless data revenue increased from $23 billion to $32 billion. And I can remember I was at CTIA when we were talking about eclipsing the $1 billion mark. Uh, so I started in 2003, so that you could see how quickly uh, the wireless data revenue uh, statistic has grown. But it's now $32 billion. That's a 39% increase from 2007 to 2008 alone. And what's really interesting to note is in that same period of time, carriers' total revenue increased by a little more than $9 billion. So you can see all of the uh, revenue uh, that on the positive side has been related to uh, the wireless data revenue. It's almost all of the carriers' growth in 2008 came from wireless data. Um, and I think that's one reason why the WIC is so important to this industry uh, and why CTIA remains committed uh, to uh, the WIC and, and what we're trying to accomplish here and uh, exploring new and different ideas for the wireless industry. And the particular interest that we have uh, at this particular uh, session is over uh, mobile advertising. And I think we've assembled some real experts here in this field, and uh, it should be a very, very interesting, challenging uh, time. And uh, we hope that at the end of the day, we come up with some good initiatives for uh, us as an industry. So uh, those are my comments. And uh, we look forward to uh, your, your input in this session as well. And uh, we look forward to having some real positive outcomes as a result of this. So again, just let me say welcome. Um, I hope I didn't offend anybody if you played for Columbia University. Uh, but uh, uh, we're glad to have you here this morning. Thank you. Well, it's true. We don't have the greatest of football teams. Um, but now that we've admitted women, maybe things will get better. Uh, the, um, 
Where's the uh, control here? All right, are we, are we on here? So first, I'd like to welcome you uh, and thank uh, Bob and thank CTIA and Steve and Mike. Uh, that was uh, great for us to get together. We're looking forward to uh, future occasions and opportunities to collaborate uh, with uh, uh, the industry and its users. Um, now, personally, I'm kind of uh, really been uh, enormously interested in the subject, and uh, we've had at CITI some uh, books and edited books on the topic, um, including on uh, uh, mobile uh, uh, mobile media uh, with uh, with with several people, such as uh, Darcy Gerbach and uh, uh, Dan Steinbach. Uh, personally, I've been uh, radio ham. Uh, uh, when I was a teenager already, so, so this kind of goes, so I was uh, uh, in my car in, in kind of early 20s, so late teenage with a two meter type, uh, type rig. Uh, this is kind of like 45 or so years ago, and so I think that was before wireless, before everybody kind of went and kind of did the same thing in the car, so the kind of, the unusual value of this has kind of totally, totally uh, um, vanished. But at the time, it was kind of like uh, extraordinary that you could actually make phone calls out of your car without being a five-star general. So, um, so I'm an enthusiast, but a, a skeptic too. Uh, and partly, maybe that is the role of an academic. Because when industry people get together, there's a certain kind of built-in enthusiasm and group dynamics, and everybody's optimistic. After all, they should be, because otherwise they wouldn't be doing what they're doing, taking the risks that they're taking. Uh, financial and career-wise, and so everybody gets very excited. So uh, academics that tend to tend to provide some of the uh, skepticism and also perhaps to look a little forward beyond uh, the uh, next few years. So where did this industry uh, come from? Uh, and I want want to weave in the gen the kind of change in advertising with the change of network platforms. Well, if we really go back, this is kind of mobile communications, and then. Uh, World War II came along and people started um, in some, some, some uses for mobile communications. And then companies like AT&T and Motorola um, here in Ericsson um, uh, in uh, Europe and so on kind of developed the uh, first generation technology that became a consumer product. This is kind of the uh, brick phone. Uh, which was kind of at the time a marvel because you could actually carry it. It wouldn't have to be installed in the car. And then second and third generation digital uh, came along and uh, pretty soon everybody was using the phone, uh, the mo mobile phones all the time for applications and uh, wireless uh, 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 devices joined television, uh, the screen of television and the screen of uh, PCs uh, as entertainment devices and, uh, and uh, the, the PC kind of moving into the uh, possibility of kind of, of streamed um, uh, media experiences. And now the fourth generation of uh, mobile communications promises us, uh, at least on, a sh on an unshared basis, 140 megabits, no, the shared 140 megabits per second. That's already <clears throat> kind of enormously fast. Um, Samsung, I believe, has developed a uh, OLED-type screen, uh, eight centimeters, enormously flat uh, screen, the new technology, with 5.1 channel surround sound for video, quali video quality experience. And you ask yourself, uh, is this a bit of an overkill, but I will kind of argue that it's not, that this is where things would be going. This is very impressive. But it is also the easy part. It is much easier for an industry to ride the tech trends of Moore's law in hardware and to ride the trends of computers and internet applications in software. Um, but it is much harder to create the business models and the content models because they don't progress at the same rate. Uh, advertising uh, is a uh, kind of an example here. It is at present, from the numbers that I've seen, a 200 to 400 million dollar uh, industry volume for the U.S. Uh, that's 200 to 400 million, depending on whose guesses you choose to pick, and that's really tiny. Um, uh, that's kind of a dollar per person in the United States, 
Uh, so there's a lot of room to grow. It's so tiny, I think the New York subway system uh, just in the city has, has more revenues uh, than that per year. Um, and so, so in some ways, perhaps, the fact is that people have been talking about mobile advertising for a good number of years, as you know better than uh, anybody, but that it has not, that it has progressed, but it has not progressed kind of by leaps and bounds, uh, kind of suggests that one needs to think ambitiously and creatively, uh, and that the advertising industry maybe is part of the uh, issue here because it thinks in terms of uh, uh, kind of gradualism and so perhaps it's useful also to th see through the kind of look through at the advertising industry itself and see where it is coming from. Well, um, this in, in a way is a kind of location based uh, advertising um, and uh, so it's very localized, very restricted and maybe we can call it first generation 1G of advertising. But then the railroad uh, came along and national markets became possible and that led to national products rather than locally produced uh, goods and services. And so we started to see uh, national products advertised and an advertising industry emerge. See this here is an ad. We still see it on late night television. It's still the same two people. Um, <laughs> We see another kind of other products here, cocaine, toothache, drops, instantaneous cure, sure. Uh, uh, and, uh, and this led then, when the technology platforms of, of electronic communications emerged to uh, the emergence of national uh, broadcasting uh, advertising, in particular, first radio, then television, after World War II, and television and broadcasting generally was the ideal medium for advertising, an ideal marriage, really, uh, because broadcasters could not charge directly. So they had to go through advertising support, they sold audiences to advertisers. So they needed the, um, the, uh, the advertisers, but the advertisers had access to national medium of relative convenience and low cost, and so television ads kind of emerged all over. Um, and, and we're part of, literally part of the culture. Um, so, so there was a mass medium, a mass audience, a mass culture for mass products. It the, was the golden age. And it is still celebrated in film and television and novels. Uh, just think of series like Mad Men and so on. This is kind of celebrating the golden age of, of advertising. Uh, but like the cowboy age, in the 19th century it was really short. And similarly powerful as a mythical force, um, this uh, golden age itself was very short, uh, historically speaking, and it could exist only when the number of distribution channels was uh, ludicrously low, two to five, for entire advanced countries, societies, economies. Um, and soon that system bega began to disintegrate uh, with cable television, multicasting, uh, narrow casting, and now the internet and webcasting and uh, maybe even user-generated content. And so this is the third generation of television, um, of advertising rather, and it is a very difficult one And that the industry, the advertising industry has still actually not resolved that. They do talk and have talked about, um, about narrow casting and, and uh, targeting and uh, all kinds of uh, uh, things that they kind of would enable people to use the ability to uh, fine tune the advertising message to different neighborhoods and to different customers and to different times of the day and what have you. But they have not really been kind of making a huge dent here. That's kind of important to recognize that advertisers still are uh, largely seeking the simplicity of the old model when in fact the media environment uh, and the technology has kind of given them the opportunities for new models. So when mobile came along, then of course kind of some of the, as you'd expect, some of the old applications, old style, not so old, but uh, were, were kind of applied here too. So from internet and from television, banner ads, text messages, coupons, links, um, and and uh, so and just kind of uh, uh, type ads that flash flash and pop up, um, but soon it was recognized that in fact the strength of the medium is to give additional stuff like 
location-based uh, geo-targeting and customization and uh, demographic targeting and interactivity, which makes it possible to create the uh, strength of the communication link, which is you can, you can watch the ad, but you can react to it and you can also bill and pay on it. That's kind of a very powerful package. Uh, and then sponsored applications like Nike, um, uh, which were this kind of exercise programs uh, that is kind of try to create an interaction with the brand. Um, but what are the prospects here? Uh, well, I mean, uh, numbers-wise, they're still not very kind of large. Uh, and there are some, some, some problems. So the problems, of course, are the ones that we all know. One is consumer resistance to being spammed, consumer resistance to being locationally followed, the privacy aspect, um, the, um, the problem also of location-based services is that it has to be reliable. I mean, you don't want to drive um, uh, 13 miles to a restaurant or a hardware store and then just find out that it has gone out of business three months ago. Um, there's uh, the um, spamming in particular. Uh, the potential for spamming is a tragedy of the commons type issue where everybody is, would be trying to kind of push their service uh, kind of shout louder than somebody else. And so there has to be a control on the, on the uh, side of the user so you kind of get the stuff that you want, such as like sales on shoes, rather than getting some kind of uh, solicitations from some local uh, male hooker. Um, so, so um, uh, uh, and, and of course people's time, is, time is, is of value and people do react negatively when they're kind of being uh, interrupted, intruded upon more than they on television. But maybe it's a question of being used to it. On television, for example, when you get some people from a European background who uh, come to the US and watch television and they find the advertising is way too intrusive because they're not used to it, whereas Americans they just kind of tune out uh, frequently when they don't want to see an ad. Um, so, so you have to give people an incentive, a, a bribe as it were, a payment, free minutes, free text messages, uh, coupons, uh, um, uh, or some other, other benefits. Now, the good news in all this is that the, uh, that, that the volume of advertising generally in, the, in society is increasing volume-wise because there's so much more information and so many more services and so much more things to sell that you have to punch through the clutter and get your, your, your product across. And so people need more advertising messages to get the point across. And you can see that in national products, it used to be a certain number of contacts that you gave you a certain kind of um, um, success rate, and now you have to kind of um, multiply that number. Uh, or you can see it, let's say, the advertising budgets for films, okay, to uh, to create, uh, even though the kind of the, the box office uh, sales are not increasing, uh, the advertising for for new releases of films has kind of increased kind of fairly substantially over over time. So that's in some ways that's the good news for advertising for people who are in the advertising business or for people who provide the platform for advertising. Um, and so you have. Um, uh, the, 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 um, um, uh, the bad news, however, is that there are more platforms such as yours, such as the mobile communications platform, competing with other platforms, and so that competition and more inventory, and that competition drives down prices. Um, and and uh, maybe with a few zigs and zags, and some people in the industry will deny it, but kind of the, the, the basic economics, the basic trend seems to be totally clear. Uh, now, so different media have different effectiveness, and it's clear that the advertising, the mobile industry has to figure out exactly what its particular niches are um, to, in order to, to get, get, uh, um, get attention. And, and marketing professors, of whom uh, I'm not, have kind of devised all kinds of ways in which to uh, uh, measure advertiser value of platforms such as kind of along three dimensions sensory intensity which is not strong for mobile there are too many distractions level of interactivity very strong for mobile um, and targetability also very strong for mobile and so so the combination 
of these three factors is different for different media. So here's, for example, national advertising of, kind of, of certain strong brands or creation of brands works very well on broadcast television. Uh, billboards kind of are very locationally oriented. This is one of my favorites. Uh, you have, okay. Uh, it, it, depends, it depends a little bit kind of on the brand, uh, and there are some strong brands. Um, uh, and then there are some, uh, some difficult brands, uh, which I'm kind of not quite sure exactly how that is going to sell in the United States. Um, and uh, um, then there are some, some kind of similar kind of language issues because this is an international medium, kind of anything that's online and data driven. Uh, and then there are kind of cultural issues here of a cultural underst understanding. But kind of, but. But on the whole, kind of the question is where, where, this, is, where this is going. And, and, and I would say kind of it's, kind of it's useful really to, to understand, understand where kind of all these kind of media are going uh, with broadbanding uh, today. And they're going into two directions. And the first one is uh, a widening of, of choices. Uh, and, and so here, the, the video over mobile is just an extension of a trend that has been going on with cable, now in the satellites, of course, home video, internet, uh, and now mobile to more and more options at different times, where, when you want it, where you want it, and so on. And this is kind of very useful and very helpful. And it's actually kind of been already quite widespread. Um, uh, here, okay, so in certain time slots in, in uh, Korea, let me see if I can show that to you. Um, if you can see here in certain sl time slots in Korea, you, uh, you actually have the, blue line, the uh, red line. Uh, you have more people watching television, or at least claim that they're watching television, over, over um, uh, uh, relative to regular television. Um, the first screen type television. So the third screen is getting more attention during certain hours, uh, which are the work hours typically where people are in the offices or commuting. Um, okay, now, let me see here, going back to, where's the mouse? Okay. So in that environment, you'd, th you'd expect television over mobile to be just another mobile handset that you carry with you, take it home with you, or take it on the bus with you. It's just kind of small. But I think that's in some ways, while that's clearly going to happen, it's not going to be a big thing because, because uh, that's in some ways that's, uh, or it's going to be a kind of a niche thing, the media flow type uh, technology is an example. Because people had access, actually, if you think about it, to mobile television for decades now, and I'm sure that many of you have bought some of these you know, analog televisions that Sony and so on that you can carry with you, take with you, or you go to some sports event and you can watch the commentary as you're watching it. But it was never a big thing, and I think most people had it somewhere gathering dust. As of three weeks ago, all of these devices, by the way, have totally gone the way of the do uh, uh, dodo bird uh, because they're all analog, and because, as far as I know, there are no mobile um, um, converter boxes, at least none that are supported by federal, federal coupons, right? And, and so, so, so all these things have kind of become totally useless. Um, um, but they were kind of useless before, too, actually, <laughs> speaking, speaking from personal experience. And so the question, therefore, is if it wasn't a big market, with analog, why would it be such a big market now? Well, okay, obviously the technology, the quality, and the availability, I understand all this, but still, keep that in mind. Uh, I think in some ways more interesting, however, is the other dimension, not the widening of choices, but the changing, which I call the deepening, and I've been kind of talking about this for a while, uh, and that is that bits are becoming cheaper to transmit and to produce. 
and therefore people will consume and are consuming more bits. And that's been going on for, for decades, if not centuries. It's information simply is becoming cheaper and therefore people are using more megabits per second because they're paying less for it. And this graph here, you don't have to kind of look at the general, at the details, just that the general trends show that the richness of media in terms of bits per second keeps increasing at a rate of maybe six, eight or so percent each year uh, on kind of an average compound annual growth rate and shows no sign of uh, diminishing. And so when we're talking about moving from 2G to 3G and from 3 to 4, that's really what we're talking about is enabling a richer form of communication, not just more of it, but a deeper sensory experience. And it will be used in a variety of ways. One of them, for example, is three-dimensionality. Here, actually, sitting relatively close at a relatively sh narrow angle is actually kind of terrifically helpful to 3G, because then you don't need the glasses. Um, and and, uh, and we already, I already spoke about the 5.1 channels. So these are all kinds of things that are happening. And then people say, well, what do we need this for? Is this kind of good old uh, television on mobile? Isn't it good, good enough? And the answer is people said that already when in the, in the, early, in the dawn of television. They said, this is a fabulous picture. We don't need anything better. Look at this, black and white, 525 lines. Okay, what, what else do you need? Uh, and so people are kind of developing new, new, new forms of, um, of, of interactivity, richer interactivity. And at first, of course, it's, it kind of looks a bit clunky. Uh, but in time, it looks, uh, it becomes, becomes more manageable and smaller, just like the mobile devices. They also started out clunky. And so this is the trend. And so, so, so in time, I think it's kind of important to understand what is this here. In time, it's kind of important to understand that television watching, television now, kind of general, and I'll get to the mobile, is not kind of sitting and looking at a box even if that box might be small and called a mobile hand device. It's not sitting across from a device, but instead tele television will be something that one straps on, something one wears, something that is around us, um, an input and output system that surrounds us, um, it kind of leading to kind of media of of total immersion, of user participation and user control. And in that environment, it seems to me when you're inside the action, inside the action such as, uh, let's say, the, the um, Pirates of the Caribbean, and you're kind of standing there in the water, and you're listening and sounds around you, and you can turn around, you're inside the action. Um, or, or in kind of your joining an exploration, climbing up Mount Everest, and you're kind of looking around you, and you can, can, can in a way from a distance, participate in, uh, that, those, that that kind of experience where you're inside of the action, participating, interacting with it, there you have to be untethered. The wire, the, the connection to the hardware device is just in the way. And that is this, the strength of wireless. And this is where wireless can go, and this is where wireless will go, uh, to be part of that immersive, <coughs> interactive um, media experience. And so in that environment, so that's, I think, where media are going, and with it, advertising. And therefore, the advertising, and to conclude, um, uh, the, the, the next generation of media, mobile media, will have two major content implications. The first. There'll be more of everything that's the widening, and you can have over mobile access to all these things. And therefore, there's a targetability, a customization, and all that possible. And I think that people have kind of focused on that and are doing it, and I wish them all the best. Uh, but for the deepening of content, uh, there, I think, work uh, needs to be done. Uh, the deepening of content, the richness, the sensory richness of content, the uh, immersion into the actual marketing experience where you can possibly drive the car, uh, <clears throat> test drive the car, or do things like that, experience where 
the clothes uh, and so on, that kind of stuff um, that kind of still needs to be developed. And I, I do believe that that's a major advantage for mobile communications uh, and for uh, new next generation of advertising. And so therefore, I believe that what we need to develop is a fourth generation of advertising to match the fourth generation of mobility because otherwise the platform will be years and years ahead of those uh, economically important applications. And if they don't kind of match the speed of the technology on the ground, the networks will uh, uh, lag uh, because the advertising and the economic business model will lag too. Uh, so that uh, was were some of the uh, thoughts that I wanted to share with you. And I wish this conference very, very much very well. For today. Thank you, Professor Noam. Uh, we've got a great lineup of four sessions today to guide you through all the elements that we think uh, need discussing with regard to mobile advertising. Um, uh, Kate Kingberger, uh, fellow director at CTIA, and Jeff Simmons, and myself, I'm Athena Polidoro, CTIA. We've uh, put together all this for you and we can't wait to present. Uh, session one, state of mobile advertising. I will um, invite the panelists to the stage, I mean, to the front, please. Good morning, everyone. I don't think these are on yet, so. Good morning. Can you hear me? Great. I'm Jill Rosengard Hill, Senior Vice President from Frank and Maggot Associates. For those of you who don't know, Maggot is a leading media and entertainment research and strategy firm. We've been working in the mobile space for probably 10 to 11 years, uh, a 51 year old <coughs> privately held company, and work with many content providers, advertisers, platforms across all different media. Um, my hope today is that these esteemed panelists will bring to you the truth of the state of the mobile advertising space and industry. Uh, we'd like to set the tone for the day um, in terms of answering your questions, as well as giving uh, unique perspectives from a carrier, from a mobile ad network, from a mobile advertising agency, and from a European perspective of consumer packaged goods experience in the mobile marketing and mobile advertising space. I'm going to introduce our panelists and then share with you from Magid some consumer attitudes and behavior research regarding mo uh, mobile advertising to set the stage. Um, on my right is Paul Palmieri. He's the CEO, founder, and president of Millennial Media, a mobile advertising network. Next to him is Kristen Svetkoven. Uh, Kristen is the director of marketing and business development of consumer packaged goods industry for BT, British Telecom, um, with great experience in the European marketplace. Um, next to Kristen is John Handel. John is managing partner and founder of Brand in Hand, working with many leading consumer packaged goods in the mobile advertising space. And next to John is Rob Hyatt. Rob is the executive director of premium content for AT&T Mobility. So we've got a really good panel. I'm going to start by sharing with you. Yes, no? <coughs> sure. Sure. We're going to jump over my slides and do some technical <laughs> difficulties. And um, what I want to start with is asking everyone just to give us a brief overview of what's your role in the mobile ecosystem and mobile advertising space. And uh, a, a short perspective of what you believe to be the state of the mobile advertising industry in terms of its life stage. Where are we? Uh, so many people talked about the year 2009 being the year of mobile. So is it? What does that mean? And where are we in our, in our life stage? Yeah. 
so Paul Palmieri, um, I have, uh, I actually have a couple of uh, slides to. Uh, do you want to pop up? Because I don't know if we have an advanced one. Yeah. Um, so Millennial Media's role, we're a mobile advertising network, and what that means is that we aggregate um, ad impressions and audience uh, across multiple properties uh, across the mobile internet. And uh, so I just, uh, as far as state of the uh, state of the industry, I just had a couple of kind of comparisons to other mediums to walk through, and uh, uh, this is uh, no more than five minutes. I don't have any pictures of cocaine ads or <laughs> stories of hookers, but uh, it's great to be back in an academic institution where <laughs> that, that can be fodder for discussion. And uh, in terms of ad standards, we would reject those go. anyway. So, <laughs> so uh, the, the, question, uh, the question, how big is the mobile audience? And this number is actually 273 million in the US in, uh, in Q109. Uh, is that the mobile audience for advertising? Well, not really because not everybody uses mobile data on their phones. Is it 150 million, the SMS users? Well, maybe for mobile marketing, where you can use another medium to cue somebody to really get in and get an experience with your brand. That's not necessarily uh, media. Uh, those, those two businesses are, um, are very different. The audience, the addressable audience, according to Nielsen um, in, um, uh, in May, was 59 million unique users in the U.S. So versus the 273 million handsets that are out there, you know, this is small but growing. Um, but to give you a sense for what 59 million looks like, it looks like almost three times the newspaper circulation in the U.S. It looks like three to four times the average primetime uh, broadcast event. So it is sizable enough where advertisers, and John's going to tell you a lot more about that, um, where advertisers are looking at mobile and they're saying, wow, we can do some of the things that we used to do in other mediums by using mobile uh, to reach an audience. Um, this is a uh, kind of a slide of kind of Google and Overture, uh, and when they reached about 70% of the internet audience, and what happened to the number of advertisers in 2002 and 2003. And I think uh, there are companies just approaching this 70% number uh, in mobile. Uh, and so if we look back to the internet, right about now, it looks a little bit like 2002 in terms of the ability to aggregate reach. One of the, one of the reasons you see Facebook not having ads in their mobile apps today is because they're more focused on audience than they are about advertising because they think first things first, go after the audience. Um, and so this magic number of 70% is somewhat upon us. There's also some uh, research on how good is the media. So um, there are some companies that measure brand effectiveness, Lyft, after doing an ad campaign online, and after doing a campaign on mobile. And uh, the di difference between the effectiveness of online and the effectiveness of mobile, um, you know, with some very credible research companies is three to five X, and, and in, some, uh, in some categories, much more. And then, you know, kind of lastly, there are some trends that are pretty interesting that are happening in other channels. So recently here, Cox Radio reported a 69% drop in net income, <coughs> blaming slower spending on radio advertising. So it is a dour time in the traditional media business. Um, I don't know whether any of you caught, for the one day that it was up on YouTube, Jimmy Kimmel's Jerry Maguire moment, but uh, he was at the ABC television upfront, and uh, he was doing a whole routine about how, uh, how what a you know, bad idea it was to spend advertising dollars on television, and it was interesting, in the seven minute you know, clip, the audience laughed for the first two minutes, and then they stopped laughing which is pretty, which was pretty interesting. And then kind of just the, the last thing here is interesting. So 38% of the people who viewed weather on their mobile phone in second half of, uh, uh, I'm sorry, this is not Q2, it's second half of 2008, did not also access this content online. So if you are a cold and flu advertiser and you are determined to spend money on digital advertising, you can't not spend money in mobile now. And so, because you can't reach the entire audience you want to reach in digital without mobile. So, 
Um, just uh, wanted to throw up those couple of slides and, and uh, Great. say you. that mobile is, is, I think, astonishingly moving quickly. It's good to hear. Just for some more perspective, there are 114 million television households in the United States today in terms of reach. Um, and cable and satellite reach about 90 to 95 million of those homes. The rest are still over the year. So in terms of the 59 million, yeah. we're, we're, we're rapidly growing um, in terms of our reach. Um, so that's great to hear. I'm going to go to John Handel to uh, also ask for your perspective. And we'll speak a little bit more about the economy because I think some of these points that you made at the end are important to come back to. John, give us your perspective on the, uh, on the state of, of mobile advertising from from your client perspective and, and from where you uh, see the industry going. Well, one, thank you very much for uh, taking time out of your uh, your busy days, and I uh, appreciate you all coming to listen uh, for what hopefully some insightful or, or, or otherwise uh, remarks we have to say. Uh, my name is Johnny. I've been in mobile since 2001. I owned an SMS uh, application company that got bought, and then Procter <coughs> Gamble asked me to come in house and run their mobile globally for three years, and then two years ago asked me to start their agency of record. Uh, we represent General Mills, Red Bull, DirecTV, Insurance, Procter & Gamble, American Express, and others. We do anywhere from 12 to 16 million a year in media spend and marketing services, so clearly small compared to the WPPs and the Publicis and all those great companies in the world, but then again, we're probably you know, 10, 15% of the mobile ad market today, so we, we do a lot of things in mobile and we're dedicated uh, to doing that. We do everything so you know from buying the media to building the mobile sites to doing the SMS campaigns and we do both mobile advertising, spend hopefully lots of money and we'll be putting a million dollars in the cold and flu work this year for VIX. So uh, Paul's absolutely right. We're going to spend about a million dollars this year for one brand alone against cold and flu. Um, and uh, we do everything from SMS and engagement in print and radio and to television and work with such great folks as uh, uh, Vibes uh, and other folks and doing lots of that great stuff. So we kind of do both mobile advertising and marketing. Um, my perspective after doing this for four years and being going from the sell side to the buy side is probably this. Mobile, you know, the TV and the PC have been primarily an opportunity for my clients and I have the largest client in the world they spend eight billion a year in advertising, which makes up more than all the auto companies now put together. Um, their attitude is we can reach people at work and at home just fine. TV and the PC, we can reach them at work, we can reach them at home. The question is, those are certain need states. There are certain relevancies and opportunities and moments and receptivity and problem solutions that consumers will lean forward and be interested in. We can buy impressions that make an impression, that persuade people. The question is, can mobile help us to reach need states and opportunities and moments for our ads to persuade, to influence, and to create purchase of our products at times and moments and places where we haven't been able to reach them before? Standing in a Walmart at shelf, all the women in the room, you know those beauty aisles or lots of products making similar claims and similar process, uh, promises and what's right for me. Um, we are now able to do things at moments and times that we haven't been before, and that's our opportunity. At the same time, we're also seeing that, what, 70% of smartphone web traffic or something is Wi-Fi based, so that means they're probably at work and at home. So that's a shifting audience question, and as audiences shift, we need to be also taking into consideration uh, that as well. So what I've learned is that mobile is not digital. Don't go running out to the digital agencies and knock on their door and say, okay, give me ad money. Mobile is as much about print, TV shifting audiences, online shifting audiences, as Paul showed, and my VIX client is going to follow, to what's happening in the print and other areas. These are the things that must, one must think about, uh, which is what we spend our time thinking about. And I think those are my top line perspective. I'll share one last thing about the year of mobile advertising. I thought a lot about this, you know, every year I'm asked by my clients, you know, is it the size of the audience? Is it the technology? What is it? And in 2009, something happened that made me feel that mobile is probably about to accelerate a bit more than I would have thought. Does anybody want to take a guess at what happened last year that probably made me think? No one knows? What? 
No. No. Obama. Obama. Who said Obama? Jordan Berman gets A. We elected. <laughs> that, yeah. We, if you think about it, think about that. A person running for the president used mobile to help get advertised, and it worked for. Him. It worked for. Him. If a, we can help elect a president using mobile, I can sell more CoverGirl, more Cheerios, more Red Bull. I mean, these are sophisticated marketing machines that have been around since, you know, at least Tide has since Abraham Lincoln. We can certainly, you know, figure out how to use mobile. That, to me, was probably the most interesting moment or thing that happened that made me realize that uh, we have the foundation to build a healthy and vibrant mobile ecosystem. Thank you. Thanks, John. I'm going to go to Rob Hyatt from at t Mobility. Rob, give us a brief perspective from the carrier side in terms of um, optimism, um, strategy. Where are we in the mobile advertising life stage? Um, thanks, Jill, and thanks, everybody, for, uh, for being here. And it's nice to be out of Atlanta in 95 degree yep. heat and uh, can wear a suit and not sweat. And yep. so it's, it's, uh, hap I'm happy to be here. Um, so uh, that, that's it. Jordan, I'm curious whether you heard that question from John before, or you just sort of zapped yeah, it. I've never yeah. heard John. That's good. You know, um, That's good. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, you know, so the carrier perspective, you know, we're obviously a, a key player in all of this. Um, you know, our imperative is really around, um, you know, this is obviously sort of stating the obvious, but, you know, get subscribers, get subscribers to do more. And, you know, so we've seen phenomenal success, uh, so driven by a lot of the things mentioned and a lot of things we'll talk about around adoption of data services. You know, the inflection point has hit, in fact, you know, to the point where, um, you know, you can't get enough, you can't build a network fast enough in some places at some points in time, you know, when Michael, when Michael Jackson, you know, passes or when there's, uh, uh, you know, the celebration afterwards. So you see these, these tremendous spikes. Um, so, so this adoption curve is going up at a, at a great pace, and that just means um, advertising creates a whole set of flexibility for us. So it's no longer, well, you know, only the 5% or the 10% who are going to spend 10 bucks for this service, uh, if you're lucky. You know, it's really, frankly, more like the 1% or 2% who are going to buy a service. Uh, now with advertising in the mix, you know, at a, at a meaningful level, not a, you know, not a massive level, you start to have um, opportunities to distribute content through, you know, free and through freemium and through, you know, consumer pays and, and all different models. So advertising has become really important for us um, to create new revenue streams. Um, to create sort of the promise of mobile beyond just communications and a little bit of content consumption. And clearly, communications is happening in a big way. And in fact, you know, it's amazing to see voice minutes go down and messages go through the roof. So the communication patterns are changing. But content consumption is, is really getting real. And it's, it's a chart like, like Paul put up. So advertising just ends up helping, you know, sort of bring all the content that's possible, content that's on other screens, to mobile and really gives us flexibility from a monetization perspective. So we're not sort of just living with, you know, 2%, 5%, 10% penetration. And, uh, and so it's, it's an exciting time for us. And, and things are maturing. I mean, I, I, I've never been a fan of the, um, is this the year of whatever? <laughs> um, you know, and I, and, sure. and I can't help but hear that, you know, is this the year of mobile data? Um, and, uh, you know, Steve said up front, you know, I remember scraping together $20 million in <coughs> revenue for, for Singular in my first year, 2001. And literally, like, I went, I think that's data. You know, we'll take that, like, $800,000, you know, as a $20 million business. And now it's, you know, it's, you know, $32 billion in data revenue for the industry, for Steve's quote. So, you know, the growth has been massive, and advertising is sort of now, now getting real, just like mobile data was. You it's know, the future and always will be. Now it's, you know three or four years real, and I think advertising's on that same path. If it's getting real, is it becoming a priority? And how, how is AT&T incorporating, incorporating uh, advertising into their strategy? Yeah, I'm afraid this is going to be like a personal interview here no. <laughs> in a moment. No, I don't want to talk too much. But um, we've made some very significant investments. In fact, you know, they're represented here. Jordan, uh, Jordan's on the Ad Solutions team. That's you know, a whole dedicated group focused on working with brands and taking the assets we've got and growing the assets we've got, not just in mobile, but, you know, multi-screen. That's a real big and important opportunity for us is to, is to work. Not, you know, mobile is sort of the promise because it's new, but there's opportunities to sort of marry together our TV and our broadband as a leading broadband uh, provider and, and, you know, a, a highly functional, although still fairly small footprint around TV 
plus mobile gives us really unique capabilities uh, to work with brands and to work with advertisers. So, so we're making very significant investments both technology-wise and people-wise and organization-wise um, because it's real. And we've got some heritage too. I mean, the, sort of what, I think the line was, I don't know if it was Jordan's line, but you know, the, the first search engine was the Yellow Pages book, right? So we've got this heritage around you know, search and find and monetize and advertise. And so we're sort of building on those roots and building on that organization to, to get to mobile and digital. Thank you. And Kristen, um, you work with uh, many leading brands, consumer packaged goods. Um, share with us your perspective in terms of um, their experience, your experience, and, um, and where you see the life stage of the mobile advertising space. Thank you, Jen. Good morning, everybody. My name is Kristen Nettekoven, and I work for BT. I'm based here in New York. My responsibility is I'm working for, or, yeah, with the consumer packaged goods industry. Um, so we, I'm in an industry marketing team in a business-to-business -business environment, and um, this is BT Global Services, so I'm in the um, large multinational um, enterprise business. And um, I'm responsible for all the companies that, you know, food, beverage, um, tobacco, or in short, anything you can um, eat, drink, or smoke, and uh, no reference to Colombia here. But uh, those are the companies I work with. So. Yeah, these are very, we sign very large contracts um, with, for example, with Unilever. They go over an extensive period of time um, and it typically involves outsourcing the entire IT needs. Um, and this contract, as an example, is a $1.3 billion contract. So they are large customers. Um, I work also with them on um, what their current needs are, but also going forward in what their needs are um, as they De develop their companies and reach out to the consumer. So um, I'm involved in several industry committees um, with the GS1. Um, I'm, and I'm very much in Europe because of um, um, where our customers are based. So what, I, what I've seen from this perspective is um, the, the ultimate objective is to get into an interactive dialogue with the consumer. Previously, it has been a very much a B2B environment from an ecosystem. <coughs> It was your supplier, your vendor, you would um, you, know, you have your ship, um, products ready to ship for the, to the retailer, you use um, TV to reach out and push your messages to the audience. This is now changing to a more, almost a consumer integrated ecosystem. So you have this C now moving into you know, all the Bs if you, if you want. And this has somehow to be managed. So the discussions I'm having with companies like Nestle or Unilever in Europe is, well, we do have a lot of um, SMS and messaging campaigns, and I, I want to under really stress here that um, while SMS um, is, it almost sounds like the black and white TV from yesterday a little bit um, nowadays, but until 2013, it's still going to account for the biggest revenue for mobile messaging. And we're talking about 83% of the messaging um, of mobile messaging just derived from SMS. And, uh, and I have a number, it's 224 billion. So this is still a huge market. It's still gonna be the, um, to continue to be the cash cow. Um, I also appreciate Paul sort of um, putting the US market in perspective. So, um, and those were close to 400 million. Um, uh, yeah, 270. In, in the US. So when we think about the world population of 6.5 billion, um, as of this year, we have 4 billion subscribers. We only have 40 million active mobile um, internet users. Yeah. So I would like to keep this in perspective. It has huge potential when you think about what is out there. You know, it's still small. So the question is also, how are we going to do this? And how do we integrate it in our existing infrastructure and operating systems? Mm -hmm. So heavy discussions are, well, I have a marketing and messaging campaign for my uh, Magnum ice cream in Switzerland. Wonderful. And it's very much on a, done on a local basis. So it works for Switzerland in Switzerland. But how do you, how do you regionalize it? It's a very fragmented uh, market at this moment. Um, consumer packaged goods companies by default are very regional because they have to. It's if food is involved. But so how do you raise it and integrate it into your existing systems, with, whether it's Oracle, your CRM systems? How do you make usage of this and apply it to a game-changing um, medium as opposed to just moving from one channel and now it's the digital or the mobile channel? This is, so how do you make it more? 
I want to follow up on that in terms of uh, the challenge. The challenge in convincing uh, traditional advertisers to move their dollars, to shift their dollars from traditional television and even online marketing um, digital dollars to mobile. What is um, what are the pain points that they have and what are the strategies that you're using, Paul, to get them to move those dollars? Well, I think, you know, one of the pain points is definitely, you know, the status quo and inertia, I mean, is a, is just a, is a big one. Um, you know, there tends to need to be some kind of build that happens for an advertiser. So take uh, Nesty, for example, you know, they sell iced tea, they don't have a mobile website. And, uh, and so, you know, one of the things that we track on a, on a monthly basis is um, the destination, you know, what's the percentage of the campaign destinations that are persistent mobile web or application uh, uh, kind of investments that the brand has made, things, you know, like, like you're dealing with, and what's the percentage that are just landing pages or sweepstakes or some kind of activity that can happen you know, in rich media, in the banner, or something along those lines. And I think, you know, we, you know, we've got a long way to go to have brands, you know, on a, on a, you know, sort of majority basis invest in their ultimate mobile destinations. And so I would say that's definitely, that's definitely one of the pain points. Um, and, uh, you know, where, where possible, we're, you know, we're helping, uh, we're helping every agency we can get the expertise to um, uh, build out for mobile and build out for the brands. Mm -hmm. And John, you said, for example, Bixel spend $1 million on mobile advertising for Golden for their, for their product. But in the grand scheme of things, $1 million is nothing. So um, do you know what the total spend is for VIX and how are you helping foster their move from $1 million to $5 million and, and what's the ROI or the value for them there? Well, um, I do know the, the total advertising spend for VIX, and that's not up for okay. announcement. Um, <laughs> you know, you can, you can, yes, I mean, if you, if you take a look at a, any given client's total media budgets and the part that goes into mobile advertising, you know, for many, many clients, digital is still underfunded. You know, digital is still growing to, you know, budgets are still shifting from TV and radio and print and other channels, and those are still at 7, 8, 10, maybe best case 15% of, the of, of, of budgets for most mass uh, large-scale marketers. Um, there's a number of reasons for that. Uh, you're asking about hurdles. I mean, one of the biggest hurdles is the, when it's like a media agency, it's easy to buy TV. It is hard to buy digital. It is easy to buy TV. Two or three people can do it. Digital takes 30. So think about that. When you're a marketer and you're putting dollars to work, if it takes me eight people because I got to buy, one guy is dealing with my search, one guy is dealing with my WAP media, one guy is dealing with my SMS stuff, and one guy has to figure out what the heck does Sprint have versus AT&T and Verizon, who I got to talk to and all you guys make it so hard. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm saying it seriously because if I have to have five people, I don't, I don't have budget to have five people to do that. I don't. So TV people can go into the upfront and see a bunch of things, make some deals, put a billion dollars to work. For me to put a million dollars to work, it takes more people than it takes them to put a billion dollars to work, and my clients don't give me the headcount to do that. So that's probably one of the, uh, the biggest hurdles. As far as uh, growth goes, I can say clearly that uh, you know, my budgets have gone more than doubled each year, year over year, in terms of billing, in terms of money spent in the last you know, three or four years. What it takes is to prove that it drives sales. Full stop. At the end of the day, if I can, if a dollar in mobile media will drive two dollars of sales or three dollars of sales of a client's product and TV's driving a dollar fifty, that's what's gonna get the money with a big caveat, which is if I can only get 30 people to do it, no one cares. So you walk into a brand like Tide that sells billions of dollars of Tide, they want to know how you're gonna add a hundred million dollars in volume, not just how you're gonna deliver you know better ROI. So you have two big issues. You need to be able to show that my next dollar on television does not perform as well as my next dollar in a mobile or some other channel and I'm able to bring you scale such that it will impact the business 
and be worth all that time and effort <laughs> of all those people. Those are the, those are the hurdles and things that will uh, be best, I believe, predictors of, uh, of what's going to happen. Uh, you know what's going to happen. I, I kind of have to agree, you know, on 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 one thing, which is the the um, the scale as it grows is catches some agencies and brands off guard. So you know, whereas two years ago there was you know a lot of mobile was in an experimental budget. I think we're to the point now where I think a lot of brands and agencies know that mobile really works well and that they're limited by how much they can buy. And so I think what we've seen you know, in the last three or four months is the agency will have a dedicated mobile budget, we'll come in and we'll say, you know, we can spend a lot more of your money in mobile. And they're like, wow, interesting. And so I think, I think deal size has really increased, particularly Q2 over Q1, um, you know, in, in a pretty big way. And now, you know, pretty big relative to where it was. Uh, so pretty big percentage increase, still not where your average online buy is, but you know, I, we definitely see brands who are saying, oh, this is not a twenty dollars to $50,000 buy, this can be a two to $400,000 buy, wow, you can spend that much money in mobile, there, there are enough at these frequency caps and at these, um, um, you know, kind of at this reach in frequency, great. Because uh, we definitely like mobile, so we definitely hear, you know, what you're saying, which is mobile is limited by, you know, how much you can deliver. Yeah, I'll, I'll add, you know, one of the best predictors to see, you know, year over year growth is, you know, facts and things that you guys can bring. I'll call them <laughs> insights about consumers. The more you can help us deliver, as an agency to our clients, insights about consumers, what they do, when they do it, what they care about. We were, I represent the largest beauty company in the world. We want nothing more than to reach a woman before she has going to have a beauty moment. Morning before she showers, at the gym before she's about to look in the mirror. What better time for a beauty brand to be top of mind before a woman is standing there and putting stuff and getting uh, herself together and to be you know, top of mind. Cold and flu, uh, checking the weather, same kind of stuff. So, I mean, if you guys can help us to understand the opportunity to reach people in need states and in moments and opportunities, that we couldn't before, and audiences that you can't otherwise reach, that will do more for increasing spend than anything else, because no brand wants to say, okay, I'm just going to give up on 20% of my consumers and not talk to them. And John actually has, go ahead, I'm sorry. John, I would like to pick up this point on um, you know, consumers you can otherwise not reach. Um, the biggest uh, discussions I'm having with the consumer package goods companies are about how can we reach all, you know, the entire, you know, the population in Asia. We're India, China, but also Africa. They don't have the existing infrastructure as we have. So it's not about moving from you know, TV or print, it's about reaching them, period. And Nokia, as a handset manufacturer, has done something very interesting um, just in India. They looked at the market and they said, India has a population of 1.1 billion, 873 million live in rural areas. So how can, you know, they're the, Computers don't exist there. There's no home or library or so there's no TV. So how do we access, how do we get, you know, there's a huge market, they're growing, they're going to get more affluent. How can we get there? So what they did is, and not only are the, is the area rural, a lot of these people are illiterate. So they developed a handset, they went into the market, they developed um, a model that is now um, icon by, um, base, symbol base, so you don't have to, you know, SMS, you're going for the letters, and I liked the professor's um, illiterate write for help um, billboard, so it's similar. So they thought about, so how can I make it easy? How can I, you know, reach this audience? So they had farmers that had, um, you know, the hands in the dirt to get the, you know, carrots or whatever is being grown there out of um, the ground. So they had dirty hands, so they developed a particular device that had a dust cover, so you could still push the button. They could get information on weather, um, fertilizers, prices. So they went into the market, but this is where the double-digit growth is. When I speak to Nestle, they're saying, you know, online and digital has only double-digit growth in those markets. And, and this, is, um, this may also drive what we experience here. So it's not just, um, it's so easy when we're in the Western world you know, how can we convert ourselves and, you know, but it's, the driver is actually in the, in the Asian market. So it's, it's a whole different ball game. 
because the infrastructure, you're starting out from a different point. Yeah. How, do you, how do you drive real top line growth? You reach a billion new consumers. <laughs> Do you got it? Who's a question? Go ahead. Yeah, actually, I have a question. Uh, uh, it actually, I question the, the way we're using the word advertising, because we're using the term extremely broadly. Um, I'll even use a random law group or president of the African American Advertising Group. Um, I was just checking uh, uh, Jack Myers, the uh, media advertiser, what we might in this world will call display advertising brand advertising, retail advertising, is a ever-dwindling portion of total marketing spend. So um, uh, over the past 10 years, according to Meyer, it's gone from about 35% to about 30% of total marketing budget, while below the line advertising, primarily consumer trade promotion, uh, and also direct marketing, has gone from about 65 to 70%. So now we have about 70% of budget Forty years ago, 70% went to, uh, to media advertising. Most of what I'm hearing from you seems to be, but not from you, John, uh, uh, not what you said before. Most of what you seem to be saying, though, seems to be about using this, these devices, mobile devices, for brand advertising. But isn't it, in fact, a more powerful technology and set of devices to tap into this much larger budget that's allocated to consumer promotions and trade promotions? Isn't that what you're really talking about? I, I, Let's let Paul and, and John help you define that. I mean, I, th I think, um, you know, in the early days, in the early days of online, uh, back, in, back in that business, um, uh, I was at a startup um, back then, it was 99% direct marketers and almost no brand advertisers. The way mobile has grown up is roughly 50-50 which is interesting. Now, it could be brands like Marriott, who's buying on a cost per click, and they are doing a brand campaign, you know? Uh, so there's kind of, a, kind of a hybrid. It could be kind of the other part of Marriott that's doing, you know, bookings right from your mobile device, and they're trying to drive different economics with a back-end cost per action that they're, that they're looking to achieve. Um, but I would say that, um, Mobile's growing up a little bit differently, and I think that has to do with, yes, the, the, the phone is a powerful interactive device that is very personal, and there are some very unique things about, you know, the fact that you're on your two feet and there's, you know, recency impact and location potential impact and things along those lines. But, in fact, I actually think mobile is taking some dollars away from television because mobile is a place where you can reach consumers individually and have a good amount of impact because you generally have one ad per page. But I, but I have to tell you that we're coming out with a, a study from Bain in a couple of weeks. Um, I'm not giving it any way, but um, it's a, a pretty big marketer back survey. Uh, a very deeply focused. And when we asked them, specifically focused on brand marketers, we asked them what they're most interested in. Overwhelmingly, I think the market is moving so quickly here that it's not keeping up with the research. So, like, uh, maybe, may, you know, maybe I'd agree with this social media piece, but 35% of MySpace's traffic is mobile. And so, you know, I think there's a lot of stuff meshed together here, um, and things are just moving so fast, and they're growing so fast. You know, I don't know that if you ask a marketer one week, uh, and not John because he's, you know, he's knee deep in mobile specific, but if you ask, you know, your average uh, uh, group media director at an agency, 
you know, their thoughts on mobile, you know, in December of last year versus today, completely different. And so uh, I just think it's moving too fast for everything to. John, how do they differentiate? Yeah. Well, I think there's there's two things you said. One is priorities, and absolutely that if you can get on the right level of the right store with an end cap at Walmart and all their stores, you're going to move way more product than any advertising campaign could ever do for you. So Point that, purchase. right? So the answer is just advertising a different channel, right? Where I'm in my shelf space, how many end caps, how much in-store displays, it's a moment of truth, she's about to make a purchase, he's about to make a purchase, how can we influence you? And you've seen the money shift to that because at the end of the day, you're able to measure that. I mean, one of the things that we always laugh about is can you measure and what does it really mean? But well, when you're in store and you put up an end cap and the same store three days before that end cap went up is now driving you, you know, $100,000 more a day in profit at Walmart, what? <laughs> you do more of that, right? You know, so the answer is in store and trade has taken over because we've seen actually consolidation in drug and grocery chains, so therefore you're spending more because you can drive more volume at better prices. The backlash has been obviously clearly in the private label uh, business and what that has meant for, for the industry. I mean, absolutely, I don't talk a lot about it at these conferences because not a lot of people in these rooms can do it, but 30% of my time is doing in-store for my CPG clients and mobile couponing and trade and utility and helping people at Shelf or CoverGirl. We offer call to actions at Shelf where you can get reviewed, go to your phone, read a review, or actually we have tools which help you decide which skin tones and colors and products at Shelf are right for me. We do tons of that stuff uh, already, just not something we talk about. So I absolutely agree with you. That's the bigger opportunity. I'm glad my fellow agencies other than Larry aren't here because they'll, I don't want them even focusing on it because I, I hope <laughs> to own that space because um, I think it's the bigger opportunity. The other part of what you said as far as social media and, and video, I mean, online video, frankly, and people may disagree, is an extension of TV. Understand that. They look at that as TV. And mobile video we looked at as TV. The answer is where's my audience I want to reach? Everybody in this age demographic three times, and t if you can find a way so I'm not overreaching people because I'm buying too much, once all that happens, it's just all going to sit within, uh, within that bucket. In terms of social media, the truth is we all love it because we can reach lots of people real quick. The problem is it's spray and pray. Understand that. Social media is spray and pray. Throw my stuff out there. So once an automotive company is done buying Edmonds and everything else, he tries to figure every, and they know all the in-market hand raisers, how do I reach... How do I get cheap enough to get as many people as I can so I can stumble upon the people who might be uh, in market for a car? And that's really the role. Lots and lots of people, extremely cheaply. Not efficient. Well, it's I efficient in the sense you can buy lots and lots of people. Very So it's not cheap is the right word? Valuable. You can buy, it's a value buy. You can buy mm -hmm. lots of people for a price that's a value price for a marketer for a little work. My view. I got a great question. So Paul made a good point how So I'd be curious to hear. I'd be curious to hear about some recent campaigns that were either mobile exclusive or incorporated mobile, and then how those are going to potentially continue to evolve. Sure. Let's talk about some case studies that was coming up. Do you have one, Paul? Yeah. So uh, a recent campaign and and um, uh, recent campaign we did uh, in the month of June was uh, Fanta which is uh, kind of a new release of the Fantanas. And it, uh, it was uh, a campaign that ran primarily on the iPhone and uh, targeted uh, Hispanic, young Hispanic females. And uh, it was a banner. And then in the banner, there were the three Fantana girls. And you could click on one of the Fantana girls and it would take you to their page. It would expand down and show you more about that Fantana you know, right from within the banner, and there was a video that you could click on, and it ran the Fantana 30-second uh, spot, which was, you know, which was pretty interesting, pretty innovative, budget probably three times the of, of our overall average um, return for, um, uh, you know, the return on that and the performance of that. I think Fanta is extremely happy with. I can't really share any of the details on it. So there's one example. Another example is uh, Marriott. Uh, last hundred days of last year, they ran a campaign. They spent about three hundred thousand dollars to drive people to their mobile booking site, m.marriott.com. 
Um, this 300,000 yielded 1.6 million bookings, and more than 30% of the bookings were for a room that very night. And that's something that can, you know, really shows the power of mobile and kind of recency and immediacy that uh, um, that mobile has off. Kristen, do you have any specific case studies that you can share? Well, one um, that we did in the UK about, well, that's been one and a half years for a frozen um, food bird's eye, for a frozen food um, company, uh, and BT managed the solution. So this involved um, uh, an interactive uh, way to engage with the consumer, where the consumer had to, um, there were, it, the, the challenge is always, uh, because SMS is expensive, so how do you, you know, get the consumer to spend the money and also to receive the text message? So they, they would send um, a code to participate in a price competition where you, you would even get um, a certain amount of your mortgage paid and there were some really attractive prices that involved. And um, you would, they would then receive um, a reply, even if they didn't win, um, for you know, recipes or ingredients. And, uh, and, and this inc um, concluded into a 24% sales uplift for um, Bird's Eye. It was their most... Um, successful uh, frozen um, entry <laughs> um, campaign in SMS messaging. So, you know, these are, you know, as I said before, it's typically what happens is you have a very, uh, you have excellent um, short stories, you know, and, uh, and the challenge in, in my area is always, so how do you make it regional, how do you take it global? And, um, and how do you make it sustainable as opposed to a one-off? So what do you do with this information? How, you, how do you build on it? And how do you integrate it in your overall um, you know, uh, CRM systems and your um, analytics? So, and this goes beyond going into, you know, how can I reach a specific demographic, you know, that age? It is really more towards behavioral, um, you know, targeting behavior as opposed to a particular, you know, age because we're, um, we're just in a different world now. It's not, uh, you know, if you're this age and you live in this area, this is how you behave. You can predict this. We are, we are becoming just more, you know, global overall. So it's really more about behavioral targeting. And, and that's where the challenge is. But Bird's Eye was a success story. So as a part of a case study, John, can you share with us that challenge of measurement and metrics that Kristen started to talk about in terms yeah. of analytics? Sure. I mean, one of the, you know, at the end of the day, the holy grail is understand did it impact, did the impression make an impression on a consumer, persuade them and get them to buy stuff. Easy for my American Express client and for Marriott, you know, Amex, you can click, make a phone call, we can decide in that day how much we spent and how many credit cards did people uh, get, insurance, lots and lots of folks who will do things like that, financial services and otherwise. So those are easier where you can measure leads and acquisitions. So that's clearly something a lots of you are doing lots of business with the thumb plays and the various kinds of folks who are selling mobile digital content. You guys have healthy businesses. Those are easier things to measure. Did someone get a premium SMS within a couple seconds and we can feed you can feed that money right back in. The much harder one is ones where you don't really know. You may be waiting for a Walmart or a CVS or a Rite Aid or a JCPenney or uh, whoever to give you your monthly or weekly reporting back telling you how sales lifted and then you're looking at can I break that out from television and from radio and all the other things that I'm doing. What most marketers do, it's called market mixed modeling. Has that anybody heard of that phrase before, market mixed modeling? We've got a couple who know, great. Um, you know, probably all the folks from the business school here at uh, C C Columbia who get taught that stuff. Um, uh, you know, what you do is you try to look at year over year, month over month, you look at and, and take va various kinds of media that you do and then you look to see what lifts. You, you write shifts, and there's ways to test media, spend more, spend less in certain channels and keep everything else static and look what it is. But then again, if the creative stinks, it kind of messes everything up anyways. So there, there are lots of challenges. I think the things that we look at most today is how many people see our ads, and when they engage, how deeply do they go? You know, how much time do they spend? How many page views do they see? Because at the end of the day, if you spend more time with a brand, you, you do some. I'll ask a question. For those who shaved this morning, who used Gillette and then we'll ask Schick last, and then we'll ask Dry? So who's Gillette? Raise your hands first. 
Okay, now who roofs Schick? One, two, three, and who did dry razors? Trash it. So we had one dry razor, about four Schick, and the rest were uh, Gillette, right? What? P&G. Yeah, which is a P&G brand. Um, it makes you feel good. But yeah, my point, my point being is, now my question for is, why Gillette? Why are so many of you using Gillette? A anybody raise their hand with Gillette? All, all the people who raise, put your hands back up if you just said Gillette. Okay? Now put your hands down, keep your hands up, but put your hands down if you've tried Schick. I've seen two hands go down. That's advertising, folks. Somehow Gillette reached you. Schick, I used both. I don't know the freaking difference. I'm a P&G guy. <laughs> uh, uh, maybe it's five blades versus four blades versus three blades. Somehow Gillette convinced you that it was a better product and you never went and tried something. So advertising nice. works is what you're saying. But, right. Five but, billion ads on football for the last 10 years. Yeah. Right. But, 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 a couple billion dollars but, later. But, but my point is, that's as bad as close, but my point is, that's how we measure. We measure in what percentage sure. of the market do we have, sure. how much are you buying, what it is, because for us, that's, that's, what, we have, that's what we really have. So we look, at big, we look at big things like that. Um, I'm going to go there. Go ahead, Len. I have a question. Uh, talking about relevancy, you know, you know, both John and Paul talk about relevant and advertising. And I guess this question is maybe for the parents. There, it seems ironic to me that um, we talk about advertising on the mobile device, but who are the people, that, you know, the, the carriers and OEMs are the ones most likely to want to reach other non-subscribers that they have or non-users of their devices. And why are we not seeing more of that sort of advertising? We keep on talking about P&G advertising, but why aren't carriers trying to reach non-AT&T users or non-T-Mobile users, et cetera? Via mobile? Via mobile. I mean, why not right on their device? How more <laughs> relevant can you get than that? I mean, Samsung should be advertising their device, you know, on the iPhone or on, on uh, you know, on other, you know, non-Samsung devices. I just saw a Samsung blackjack ad yeah. on my iPhone yesterday. Yeah, I mean, that would be, it seems like we'd be eating our own dog food here, guys. And well, we're not uh, doing it today, other than for advertising ringtones. I, I'm going to let Rob answer, but before I do, I'm, I like just, to hear gonna that, yeah, the I'm just going to give you an example. In the cable ecosystem, yeah. same thing. You want to reach television viewers to promote your television show. Um, it took a long time for one network to allow another network to promote the program on there. In the cable world, there is a handshake agreement that you can promote the content, but you cannot promote the time that the show airs. Mm -hmm. So it took a long time to get there. Having said that, Rob. Yeah, yeah that's interesting because even when we're um, a sponsor of something like the NCAA basketball tournament, you know, when we're on, not on CBS and advertising on other networks, you know, it gets all genericized because we, we just want to sort of, you know, get the message out at and NCAA basketball tournament, watch it, buy phones, and, you know, so I know enough to know that, you know, there's, there's a set of limitations across. Uh, but I think to, to more directly answer your question, I think it's just, it, it's early, and I think the, you know, sort of the willingness to say, wait, there's some risk here, I may gain or lose, depending on it. And, and I think the other thing is, we're, you know, I don't know, John knows the number, I don't know it exactly, but, you know, we're, we're one of these, you know, multi, multi-billion dollar companies from an advertising perspective. So, we're, you know, we're, we're pushing the big rocks around and buying, buying idle sponsorships. And so, so the stuff that we're running on, I'll let Jordan, Jordan finish it, but the stuff we're running on mobile is really, really pretty targeted, you know, get people to, to upgrade and, and, you know, sell accessories, buy content. Sort of, yeah. sort of value add, value added stuff at the top of the pyramid um, for existing consumers, you know, with excess inventory or targeted um, to those who are likely. Len, how much, how much advertising do you let uh, MSN run on you to stop becoming an M uh, Yahoo mail user and MSN mail user? Do you know what that number is? By how much you guys, <laughs> how many Yahoo people call? Yeah. Right. It's an issue. I'm not talking about Yahoo. Why? Google buys and. Go to Yahoo Search. You find big ads on Yahoo Search. So you do it. Go ahead, Jordan. When we look at mobile marketing, Jordan Murphy from AT&T, we look at a full suite of mobile markets. When you look at American Idol, you typically think of AT&T and texting. So we are a big mobile channel. I think we'll see more mobile ad buys coming out of AT&T's media group. But there are restrictions among carriers, especially to 
to put competitors on deck. And, that, and that's not only for wireless carriers, but for the TV business and broadband business. So you, know, you wouldn't see a cable vision ad on an AT&T handset on deck on MediaNet. You might see it off deck on a TV or ESPN. Likewise, they're not going to carry our advertising. And it's no, not unique work. to mobile. Like I yeah. said, it's in the cable and broadcast industry as well. So uh, having, 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 you know, having been one of the people to respond to the the uh, early, you know, the earliest interested carrier in doing this for like two years in a row and making the phone calls around to say, are we dropping the handshake agreement? What is the handshake agreement? What are the, what are the, you know, kind of, what are the boundaries of on deck, off deck? You know, some are like it's on deck publishers, not just the on deck inventory, but you know, I would say as of December 1 last year, the handshake agreement significantly relaxed and there's a lot more money I think being spent now than there was I mean there was almost no money being spent before December 1 last year there's a lot more being spent now. Yeah. You know, we're, 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 trying to, we're all trying to jump start the market right now. Absolutely. We should be showing others how great our CPC is, how effective our channel is. We're not advertising our own goods on that channel. It's hard to. And Yahoo is a, is a fantastic citizen on that as well. Let me ask a couple. Let me ask a couple follow-up questions here. And a, and a very good partner and uh, and client. So. I, thanks, guys. I'd be remiss if I didn't ask the the question that's you know, been on everybody's mind, which is the economy. What role did it play in the success and growth, or uh, resistance or obstacles this year in terms of uh, mobile advertising spend? Paul. Uh, I mean, I don't really think we've seen it. The market is too small, I think. Um, you know, it's pretty weird going to a cocktail party in the neighborhood and people are like, how's your business? And uh, I'm like, it's going, it's, it's, it's going pretty well. <laughs> uh, and, you know, for those of you who are, you know, who are, you know, in some of the, some of the later stages of, some of the content businesses that are accelerating right now or, or uh, you know, in some of the, you know, some of the other businesses in mobile that are growing fast, you'll know what I'm talking about. But, uh, you know, we really, you know. Didn't feel it. We didn't feel it other than an acceleration, I think, driven by real weakness in traditional media. John? You know, but, but the, given the state of our clients, we benefited. I mean, if you look at General Mills just posted 94% increase in profit. So we picked well. And that fact, funnily enough, we went after them specifically because we knew people. Easier that, to eat cereal than go out for scrambled eggs. You can, you can feed a whole family for breakfast for a week on one box of Cheerios for $5.99. So. And lower your cost. And lower your cost. <laughs> but, but, the government is, but the government is coming in and, you know, that's. Right. As long as the FTC, yeah. So, um, so, so. By, by the nature of some of our clients, that American Express hasn't done anything in six months. So, you know, we've, we've been fortunate to have marketers who tend to do well in general, but then super well when, when things are bad, um, our economies are bad. So that, that's been good. I, but looking around, what I'll probably say is that you're going to see, and I think Randy Rothenberg can probably say, is that digital is not going to be down. We're not going to have seen less overall digital spend, or correct me if I'm wrong, um, it's, it's not significant, you know, we're Flat. not. Flat. Well. It's, uh, it's down uh, 15, uh, sorry, it's down 5% uh, uh, year on year in the first quarter of this year. But share is growing enormously. The newspapers, magazines, radio, and that's where the report Right, so, so for, you know, channels like ours, we haven't seen as much stuff. I've seen, you know, my budgets are, 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 are 2x. The real question for me is would they have been 4x if, if, if things hadn't happened? Um, uh, I don't think so. I think not because you know our, our clients are doing, are, are doing well. I think the bigger issue that's affecting budgets, now I'll, I'll say this, because I made this point earlier, I wanted to stick home. What actually has been cut is that what's called the non-working dollars. <coughs> Agency fees, the costs of putting media money to work, everyone wants cost savings and cheaper, and all that kind of stuff. That strangle on that part of the business has probably done more than in some, well, maybe the auto is being different, but in, in, in choking some of what I think some dollars that, that, uh, 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 that, that could have been there. I will say, and Paul made this point earlier, 
which is, in, and you talk about metrics, I mean, I think some of the things that are actually holding mobile back is less the economy than the ease and the ability to understand, measure, buy, put it into the, the system. I mean, look, was the mobile ad market up? Uh, $100 million, maybe 150, I don't know, someone, Paul probably knows better than me, um, or the carriers, but you know, I, I don't see that being, it's not big enough where anyone's gonna really say, oh, that's gonna save me. Measurement is holding you back, uh, the economy? Is a measurement, ease at buying, uh, you know, b one of the biggest problems is being able to actually Paul said put money, being able to easily put you know, a good amount of money to work and get measurements, probably a bigger deal for some of my clients than the economy is. Let me ask the last question then, Rob. In terms of measurement, what is AT&T and the other carriers doing to create a reporting structure, a measurement that will help grow this business? Yeah, obviously it's a, it's a big deal. The ability to target and the ability to measure are, are central. And I think, uh, my friend Jordan, you want to sort of go, go into a level of detail you've got? Yeah, and I'll, I'll give a shout out to my Please. friends at the MMA. Um, you know, we're, we're very engaged with them in terms of helping to, to develop some standards. Obviously, the players like Nielsen and Inside Express are, are really trying to come to the table and it's standardized. Um, you know, this is a relatively new business for all the carriers. Uh, and we all have an interest in making sure that there's transparency and there are standards. So John can go to his clients with, with confidence to say, hey, here's what you bought, here's what you got. So I think there's work to be done, but and uh, I think we're going to see some, some major uh, enhancements. Plus, you're, you're seeing the, the rise of uh, third-party ad serving. So some of those tools that a lot of the online folks are more comfortable with. And John, you know, to your point, even though the mobile maybe shouldn't necessarily be ghetto to, ghettoized within digital and take from digital, it's underfunded. Unfortunately, I think a lot of the, the, the mobile folks sort of are coming out of online. I mean, one, one of the great questions, I just asked uh, Yahoo, it's so, so uh, today, when are we going to have third-party pixel impression counting on AT&T, which Yahoo sells, and the answer is not yet. So, I mean, that's, you know, because the measurement isn't just about sales. That's harder. I'm talking about just being able to have a third-party person tell you how many impressions were served, how many people sure. saw your ads, which are just, it's like not even table stakes. This is like salt on your table. So, measurement. in terms of life stage, just to, final, to end this here, where would you say we are in our life stage? Nascency, infancy, toddler, Rob? Um... <laughs> mobile, mobile, but not highly mobile. You know, uh, <laughs> crawling but not walking. No, no, I think two-legged mobility. But okay. uh, you know, you know, early, early life stage. You know, obviously a lot of, you know, moments of greatness and moments of, of challenge. Good. Um, but I think I do think to the point about the economy, it sort of crystallizes for people. Wow, this is a powerful tool. All this, you know, all this interactivity and immediacy and location mm -hmm. and viral, you know, we didn't even talk about the viral aspect of it, but, you know, adoption of a whole bunch of our services have been virally oriented and sort of cracking that nut so that, you know, you're passing along something that's of value, not just, hey, you hit one person in the head and sold a cup of coffee, but, you know, how do you get, you know, 100 a friends community. going? And so, you know, because mobile's all about, you know, what's happening now and what's with you, there's tremendous potential. So I think, you know, a, a gifted and brilliant five-year-old <laughs> who still has a tantrum now and then, what do you think? Uh, I, I, I think we're, uh, I think actually mobile for a while has been in the toddler phase. It can kind of walk. It needs some help. It falls over a lot. I mean, at the end of the day, how many of us just have phone calls that get dropped on the iPhone or the Bolt 3G from oh. these guys as I'm going from Come cell on. tower to cell tower? <laughs> so, okay, no, I, I mean, I, I'll only be next time frustrated with that, but that's not, but, um, so I think, I think, I think, um, yeah. Well, it's hard when I'm trying to sell. I'm trying to convince a client to do something. My phone drop. keeps dropping. When I'm trying to, like, well, that can't work. How the heck are we going to do this? Um, so I do. What I think is going to happen, though, is I think we're going to skip from the toddler. We're going to skip one through six. I think we're going to find ourselves in seventh, eighth, and ninth grade. We're in a university more quickly. So I think we're moving from that toddler, skipping third, fourth, and fifth grade, and we're probably going to be entering middle school. And then hopefully from middle school, we'll skip high school and get right into college. So you're saying we're going to skip that ugly Except stage. Except those are the best years. Yeah. yeah. But skip the ugly stage in the, in the photos. Go ahead, Chris. In, in my opinion, it's like um, kite surfing. We got to, while we, we are trying to fly, we still got to ride the wave. Okay. And Paul? I like wow. that. I like that too. Uh, infancy, toddler, crawl, walk, run. I don't know. I've walked. I've, I've run, but uh, I was, you know, I've also crawled in the middle of the night after having too much to drink. So I, I really don't know. I really don't know where we are. But I would just where say that. Going? I would just say that. I think where we are 
is surprisingly mature for where I think everybody would expect. I, I think it's just, I'm, I'm not gonna say where I think we are, because I really don't know, but I think it's surprising. Okay. It's, it's Thank you all for sitting for the first session. <laughs> Thanks for the participation in the house.